And as Ghana's case number increases, of course, it is important that we continue with COVID-19 360 to further educate Ghanaians, especially on how they can protect themselves, whilst also informing you of what may be happening around the world. You're welcome. My name is Bella Mundi. And my name is Anita Ikir Kufu. And at the press briefing yesterday, Ghana has recorded an addition of 121 more coronavirus cases. And our last figure was 1,550. Now we are at 1,671. So that should tell you that you need to be staying safe. And the more you move, the more the virus moves. This is COVID-19 360. We're here to give you all the breakdown, all the things you do not understand. This is the place to be. And thank you so much much for joining us definitely and so like we mentioned Ghana's numbers have increased and there has been a breakdown and so we'll quickly go to that remember that we'll be speaking to our experts today it looks as if after the president lifted the lockdown people have also relaxed and so they are not really taking into consideration the precautionary measures uh, to ensure their safety and that of everyone else around them so what could be leading to this and does it mean that maybe we would have to go under lockdown again we'll hear from our experts um, what they think about this particular situation as well. If you have any psychological effects from uh, COVID-19 as well, send us your questions via social media so we can forward it to them so they can prepare their answers ahead of time all for you. And so let's take a look at the numbers at this point in Ghana. Anita? Yes, like I mentioned earlier, our case count now stands at 1,671. That is an addition of 121 more cases. And the case count per region is as follows. Greater Accra region still standing in as the epicenter with 1,433 cases. Ashanti region with 84. And when you go on the Ghana Health Service website, it gives you the case count from highest to lower. So Eastern region with 57. Upper East region with 18. Central region 18 as well. OT region 17. Northern region 13. Volta region an additional of 1. And the case count is at 11. Western region with 9. Upper West region 8. North East region 2, Western North region 1, and Savannah region, Bono region, Ahafu region, Bono East region have still not recorded any case yet, which is some good news. So let's move over quickly to the recoveries and like it was mentioned yesterday some people have tested their first negative and it is expected that after the second test they will test negative that is hopefully so we have more recoveries as well so 33 more recoveries have been recorded and our recovery cases is at 188 previously it was at 155 our deaths five more have been recorded from 11 to 16 and when you come to the gender distribution females now stands at 30 39% with males at 61%. Let's look at the travel history that has been updated as well. No clear history of people or the total number of cases we've recorded. People with no clear history of travel is at 87% and those with travel history at 13%. Travel history, I should say, keeps decreasing. Initially, it was a little more over the 20% mark. And so it looks like the more cases we keep recording, the more the travel history percentage reduces. Uses. That should tell you that community infections, community spread is more right here in Ghana. And so when you visit the Ghana Health Service website, it gives you a total breakdown of also the COVID-19 website, uh, COVID-19 hotspot map as well. So in totality, Bella, this is how our case count is looking like in Ghana. And if I could just add on, and so let's break it down to how we arrived at these numbers. And so for general surveillance, according to Dr. Patrick Abwaji, who is the Director General for the Ghana Health Service, uh, we had 561 people testing positive. Now, of course, mandatory quarantine still stands at 105. And for enhanced contact tracing, they arrived at 1,113 people who tested positive for that. Now, out of the total number, which is 1,671, it says that 1,461 of them are doing well with no symptoms. And so, uh, of course, they're being treated even though there are no symptoms. And there are six that are moderately or critically ill. Under that, we have two of them at the UGMC. That's the University of Ghana Medical Center. We have three at the Ghana East Hospital and one 
at Kolebu. And we still have some 68,000 backlog of tests uh, that we're uh, waiting for to get the results as well. And so that's basically it. And also the total number, again, they're saying that 237 of them are in isolation centers across um, the country. And if you have any questions, like I said, we'll be speaking to our experts quickly uh, to find out from them what, we th what they think about the lockdown um, that has been lifted and whether it's causing people to become a bit more relaxed. But let's just do a quick disclaimer. So yesterday we had an interview with the Director General of the National Population Council and she gave us her thoughts on a report that we had done. Now this report was from a comment that or a statement that came from Marie Stopes, which is a reproductive health um, hospital, indicating that there could be about 16,000 unwanted pregnancies as a result of the lockdown three weeks, um, the three weeks lockdown that Ghana experienced uh, some weeks ago. And so quickly take a look at this report again and we'll come back. Okay. Under a partial lockdown for three weeks as a measure to contain the coronavirus spread, President Kufu Adu had earlier encouraged formal sector employees to work from home. Access to contraception was a challenge during the restricted movements for some women who could not visit family planning centers to get their preferred methods. An estimated 26,600 women and girls in Ghana, according to Marie Stoops Ghana, lost out on access to contraception during the lockdown period. We believe that almost 100 women may die due to pregnancy-related, you know, deaths. Over the years, we've been dealing with women, going out to offer these services to women. So when this COVID happened, women who come to assess these services have reduced. So that's the projection that we think will happen. Attendance to the family planning unit at the Kumasi South Hospital dropped by 50% during the period. Before the lockdown, we were getting around maybe 40 to 50 clients. But during the work, uh, the lockdown came around 25, at times 20, yes, about half of the number. The unit also administers contraceptive methods to teenagers who are sexually active to prevent unintended pregnancies. Medical director of the Kumasi South Hospital, Dr. Kwame Buedu, though uncertain about the figures, encouraged adolescents to be responsible in the wake of the COVID-19. I don't know that the mother people are using to make those projections. But once you keep people indoor for a considerable amount of time, certainly the, the, the pregnancy rate is going to, to go up. People must abstain when they need to abstain. And people must use methods where they need to use methods. Marie Stopes, which works in 37 countries across the world in providing contraception and safe abortion services, has been operating in Ghana since 2007. And so that was a projection from Marie Stopes, and we only spoke to the National Director uh, of the National Population Council to give us her thoughts on it. And so just some correction on there for those of you who thought that she may have made those projections. Now, let's move on to the Western region, where some 71 persons, uh, the coastal quarry in Shama, where the Western region recorded its first COVID-19 cases, have tested negative for the virus. And so we'll be speaking to our reporter, Eric Yao Ejay, to give us more insight on that. We were, we were told that we recorded our first COVID-19 case. And that case came from a Chinese national that was working 
with a coastal company, a quarry company here called Coastal Quarry Company Limited. And since that happened, samples of some 71 persons we hear are suspected to have come in contact with the Chinese national were taken to the Noguchi Memorial Center for testing. Now, since the news came out, there's been a lot of uh, agitations here in the Anto community. We are told that some residents here have been stigmatized, and this has resulted in a lot of, if you will, again, agitations here in the community, that when they go to other communities to trade, they are singled out as coming from a COVID-19 infected community. Um, last night, the results of the 71 persons came and thankfully they all tested negative. We are here in the community to look at how the residents are responding to this, if you will, good news. So I have with me the assembly member for Anto, uh, Mr. Owe Ewe, for him to tell us how the community is receiving this news. Uh, good morning and welcome to COVID-360 on TV3. Thank you very much for your time. We'll come to the result, but since the case was reported, what was the mood here in the community? I think it has been an excited mood. Uh, we believe that we've been cleared from the hook that uh, the community... I, I, want us, I want us to deal with the, with the test results later, but mm. since the samples were faking... Um, before it was, the result even came out, we want to find out the, the situation here. Yeah, before the result came, you know, ever since the sample were taken and then the 71 people were quarantined, uh, we've not had some sort of a breath or peace, if I should say so, because it came to realization that uh, once the company exits close to the community, there's a belief that the people in the community might also be, you know, be infected with the virus. So when the 71 were quarantined, we were all in anticipation that uh, we had to wait for a result to come to see whether indeed once they come to the community market to have interaction with people or once people go there to transact some sort of business, is it possible or it is possible that somebody might have some sort of a virus. But uh, ever since the news were, you know, uh, was broken or the, uh, what do you call the tests were taken away, uh, that was the mood. And since the news has been given to us, I think almost everybody is calm now. We were told that uh, the youth were so agitated that they had wanted to demonstrate because they faulted the regional minister for mentioning the name. They were thinking that at least they would just say Shama so that they will not become a focal point. It was true. Uh, you see, if you look at elsewhere across Ghana, where there has been you know, this COVID-19 issue, we don't specifically mention the particular place where you know, the virus or whoever has been infected was. But in our case, our name Community Anto was mentioned, uh, you know, attacked to uh, the quarry company that they have, you know, that Chinese national who infested the virus. So, indeed, uh, the, quite a number of the youth were, were not, in a, you know, uh, very happy. In fact, it even came from the elders, the chief and elders of the community, thinking that uh, if it has happened elsewhere and the name of a community was not mentioned, how come when it comes to Anto, the name Anto should be mentioned? So that brought the, the agitation. I'll come back to you. So we also have one youth leader, and I want him to explain to us how the youth received the news. And yeah, sure, the time COVID, you know, what we call you know, now I had a why many many pa. Oh, that's the the mbebu no one ano na a youth no so many. Well, it wasn't easy. Eshe ashasirama case na be na ubi ayi tede anto we record the first case, you know, na na ni yesho. Uh, it's not bad because as you see here now, Madena Kakoyano and other communities now over the electoral area, Hano, and it is room for other towns, Hano, will be on pedal or the MBA engaged because Yen Yerbanibi. And according to World Health Organization, which remember there, Yerban or a pandemic or a deadly, it can kill you at any point in time. And so, ma, even for Manka Samusto, Murtana, it will be bad. I don't know today, only your friend, the Yerban be Abba Hanepe and our store pay. Now, okay, you have a car, the Yoko, Ada, if you are tired, you could do one. You have a car, car, no fair. If you come for Tammy and the Hadeno, it's being called virus junction. And any other activities, although according to you, are very slow, all because of this very pandemic diseases. And the youth now had all holiday. You have fun so easy, them. And you have so no Kakra, or the Yabia, as youth are all Hadeno. Yeah, yeah. Ah, you too, now you're supporting your name. Community, ah, oh yeah, and Tassiano, 
we declare the virus free, another COVID 19 free tower. CCR, the only thing, ah, being TV3, one of the first TV station, another media house, media journal, what to now, we break the new cinema, work international, the CCR, and work on top. Oh, yeah, COVID free town. We are very happy and so excited about it. Okay, so um, let's look at how the community has received the, if you will, the good news that all the samples came out negative. Yeah, in fact, that was the anticipation of every native of this community. So when the news came to us, and uh, especially the 71 people who were quarantined, we were not surprised because everybody believed that uh, we don't have the virus. And indeed, when the news was broken to us, we took it in good heart. So there was celebration. If you could hear from uh, some of the ladies who were selling at the markets, uh, since yesterday, they were calling me to organize some sort of brass band, get some uh, powder, and then let's move around to let people know that indeed when we were tagged as a COVID-19 community or a town, for now there's absolutely nothing like that. So we received it in good heart, and we are happy about the news. Does this mean that you're going to leave your life to chance? Absolutely no. Totally no. We aren't going to do that. If you look at me now, I'm having my nose mask on. Uh, go around, cast your eye back and see people around. You see most of them moving around with their nose mask. If you look at, just at this point, we have Veronica Bakat one here. Just a few meters, there's another one placed there. What it means is that there's, there's been some sort of education for the people. Every inch or distance you move, make sure you wash your hand under running water. There are provisions for sanitizers, tissue papers, what have you, for you to use. If you go to the quarry company, it's a similar thing has been done. We also exercise or uh, what you call practicing what you call social distancing. Social activities like football, community engagement are no more. All because we need to ensure that we also go by the rules and regulations being laid out by the World Health Organization so that we don't, if possible, somehow even have it. We don't contradict or spread the virus among ourselves. Do you know where these 71 persons are currently? At the moment I speak with you, they are where they were quarantined at the uh, Coastal Quarry Company. Uh, this morning we had an interaction with them. Uh, the DC, the regional police commander, the district police command, BNI. The entire COVID-19 district team came. We went there. We've had education with them. And their second sample for the second confirmation is being taken out. So at the moment, they are outside. I'm sure by now they should be done with that exercise. When they are done, uh, we have to disperse them for them to go home and have some sort of a, a fresh air or relief with their family, relatives, and later maybe report back to work to work. So for now... They are the quarry site where they were quarantined, but I'm sure by close of day, they will leave the place. So any special thing you are going to do to help remove that um, Vassan town tag away from Anto? This is the first point of contact. This is what we are doing now. Once you are here, we know that we've gone international. We've gone almost everywhere. Uh, myself, the youth, the chief and community elders have also uh, come together. We formed what we call anti-COVID-19 team. We are educating people from one electoral area to another. All the seven communities within our electoral area, we are using the, uh, what we call the information service van to educate the people. We are also visiting radio stations around us to ensure that that stigma or that tag that was put on us uh, will be no more. Since the news has come that we are COVID-19 free, we also have to ensure that we go that extra mile to educate the people. So we are on education extensively, massively. We are going every nook and cranny of the electoral area to ensure that people get the news that there's nothing like virus within and through about the electoral area, but we have to protect ourselves. Okay, in the CCI, you know, I didn't know only them, one another one, you know, we should do. Well, thank you. I shall see CCI, yeah, yeah, it is part of it. They grant interviews on media platforms, you know, because as at this very morning, now, DC in any health directorate, Timmy in Abaha. On your we don't come on. We told them, say, no, well, this one, one boy, to the stand, say, over all the platforms, sir, or call the local car, this COVID 19 issue has been the entrance to the western region, no, one car, no, beyond to the Ampa, a Hanon, so no, yes, yeah, the Yenibi, and the work of platforms, be your call, your car, and the announcement. We use that platform, and again, to, I'll be very happy, yeah, but yeah, now you're the possible assistance around the drive. Obibio no oba fehbia we muda ampa anto aya covid free. Okay. Na na mamfa last word mo. Na na no mamsa bet na wale. Si si. Da anya so mi ogbe me ya ya nda. Da you to way ye na no. Na ye ye ti ye ni ye ni me ye ni. O san da uno eni mu gasa kasa papa papa. Na wada me hen. Internet me wada me hen ni de. Wo hwa brass band. 
COVID-19 free. But uh, we do know that samples that the person, the 71 persons who, who tested negative, their samples are taking, being taken again so that they will reassure themselves that indeed they are free of COVID-19. Eric J TV3 News, Takrad. region, even though they still have some recorded cases, but at least 71 people testing negative um, is great news. Now, you remember that there was a directive from government to have all health workers ride Ayalolo buses for free during COVID-19. There's an update on that, and that's coming from Dela Michel, who had an interaction with Fred Chidi, who's a PRO of Ayalolo. It seems as if another directive has been given, and this time around, health workers may not be able to ride for free. Take a look. We have had uh, official communication from the Ministry of Transport suspending the service. Ayalolo will withdraw the service that we provide for emergency health workers. Uh, this, you know, in the heat of the coronavirus, Ayalolo was tasked to provide transport services to ferry health workers from uh, their various homes to the various hospitals, which we have done in the last three three weeks. But um, there is an official communication from the Ministry of Transport asking that we suspend the services. Hmm, interesting. We'll speak to authorities and find out more about why they have given this directive. But anyway, let's take a look at Africa's case count. So on the African continent, our case count is almost at 35,000. Yesterday, we were over 33,000. And I should tell you that looking at the figure we have now, by the end of today, we'll definitely be over 35,000. And that is over 1,000 cases being recorded uh, in between every 24 hours, which is quite worrying. And so our confirmed coronavirus cases in Africa is at 34,924. Recovered cases yesterday was at over 10,000 today. Okay, so some more recoveries being recorded as well, 11,336. And coronavirus deaths on the African continent is at 1,529. And interestingly, Egypt uh, is now recording the highest number of cases on the African continent with 5,042 cases of coronavirus and south africa is coming in closely and i'm sure by the end of the day or even in a few hours south africa if they're doing more tests will also be above the 5,000 mark as of now they are at 4,996 so let me give you uh, some other countries who have recorded over a thousand cases so now egypt is the highest followed by south africa and algeria with 3,649 so this is not in any any particular order but i'm giving you countries that have recorded over 1000 cases cameroon with 1806 and when you come down here cote d'ivoire with 1183 djibouti 1072 i mentioned egypt earlier ghana coming in with 1671 guinea with 1240 still lesotho and comoros the only two countries on the african continent who do not have any coronavirus case yet. Morocco has 4,252. Nigeria, wow, 1,532. And a few weeks ago, they were not doing much tests as well, and they had no lockdown. And they were around over 300 cases. And just a few weeks down the line, they are recording over 1,532 across uh, over 30 states as well. And so Sao Tome, some weeks ago, was at 7. Now they are at 11. South Africa, I've mentioned earlier. And so basically, this 
are some of the figures. If you want more figures, you can go on the Africa Argument website. And yesterday, I spoke about the cases in Africa over time. The projection was at 35,000. This morning, the projection is at 40,000. So definitely by the end of the week, we should be looking forward to inching closer to the 40,000 mark because more tests are being done on the continent. And looking at how sharp the curve has risen, that should tell you that more tests are being done. And so from the 17th of March to the 28th of April, we are over 30,000 and inching closer to the 40,000 mark. And so there you have it. When we come back, we'll be giving you more updates on what is happening globally and also right here in Ghana. This is COVID-19 360 right here on TV3. You can share your thoughts and comments with us on our various social media pages. Our WhatsApp number is also active. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360 time to interact with our experts. And again, Ghana's case count at the moment is at 1,671 with 16 recorded deaths. Now, the conversation now is more about the lifting of the lockdown and how it looks as if Ghanaians feel the, uh, you know, the pandemic has gone down in the country and as a result are not really adhering to the precautionary measures. And so really, what could be the worst case scenario and what could happen if this lifting of lockdown continues and people still disregard the precautionary measures? Right behind me, I have my doctors. And so Dr. Newman Arthur yesterday gave us some 12 key points on all the positives that we can identify from COVID-19. And so yesterday we enjoyed that session with you. And so you're welcome back. And also we have back with us this morning, uh, Dr. Betha Sewa'ai, who's an infectious disease specialist. And so good to have you back. And I hope yesterday you missed us. <laughs> yes, I did. You very did. much. Well, welcome back. We all missed you as well. And so let me start off with you, Dr. Betha. I'll come back to you, Dr. Newman. Today we're still going to touch on the, the positives of COVID-19. But Dr. Betha, so at this point, people seem to be getting tired. We have what we call corona fatigue because people even hear about corona and they're like, okay, not again, let's move on. Ghana has lifted the lockdown so we can go about our duties and everything. And we're recording more cases. Our numbers uh, in terms of death has also increased as well. What really is happening? Does it mean that we're not really paying attention to it? And maybe was it a wrong idea to have lifted the lockdown? Respect the decision of the leadership. Um, they know all the factors that they considered before they um, embarked on removing the lockdown. We don't know all the extenuating circumstances, so to speak. However, I think there should be a countermeasure. The, one, the minute we've taken off the lockdown, there should be more education so that people will understand what the disease is and what they can do. Yes, it appears that maybe the people who can understand and speak and read and write English may have fatigue. But there's a lot more people, those in Kotokraba market, those in Takrade, you know, those in Northern region. We need to reach more people because our nation is not based in Accra. Our nation is the whole country. So we have to make sure that we're getting our messages out there in as many languages as we can. And we also have to have a way of enforcing the social distancing, meaning in the markets or in the, there should be little signs on the floor that tell people, where to stand. That's how a lot of um, developed countries have solved the social distancing problem. Even mm. if you use paint to mark on the floor that can only stand here and here and here. Otherwise, I realize that as a people, we're used to crowding. You yeah. ask us to go for food, we're not going to form a nice queue. People are just going to rush. Even when you form a queue, people will rush. And so we, we always have to be aware of those factors and, and continue to educate as many people as we can. I don't think all is lost. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of hope that with continued efforts, we'll be able to make a lot of progress. And yesterday, I noticed that on social circles, it appears that Ghana has come up with a, an antibody test. And yeah. so if all these things are rolled out on a massive scale, we'll be able to get a better idea of where our disease parts are. And um, I think we'll be able to gain control of the situation. So in terms of gaining control, at what point are we on the curve? Because now the curve has become very popular when talking about COVID-19. There's flattening of the, of the curve. It's rising at one point. You know, it's reducing at another point. What point are we as a country looking at our numbers? I still think we're at an exponential stage. I mean, we're following a route that the virus characteristically follows when it enters any community. 
meaning they will be spread. But I think what the government is doing in terms of making sure they are tracking as many cases as possible will help. I mean, definitely you can't reach every nook and cranny of uh, the society. But I think the little, you know, what they know how to do, um, they are doing it well. We need to make sure that more of our healthcare providers, I understand there are 13 people who have been infected, healthcare yeah. providers, and they were not in the treatment center. So I take it to mean that maybe for one reason or the other, they had relaxed on their personal protective equipment. So we need to make sure that all those things are, I mean, I mean, even myself, sometimes after taking care of a few of those patients, you gain some false sense of confidence that, oh, now I can go close. And mm -hmm. you quickly have to remind yourself that, look, this is a disease that kills. Make sure you are still executing as much. So I can identify with the corona fatigue. I mean, oh, now there are three of them. Okay, this one has this and... You know, you, you can't forget that, well, this is the same disease that was killing thousands of people in Italy. So I think that reminder is important, which is why it validates why we're doing this program every yeah. day to remind people that it's, it's alive and kicking. Definitely. So, so then, Dr. Newman, yesterday you gave us some 12 happy points, I could put it that way. And, you know, the conversation was that if doctor is telling us to think of the positive sides of it, then maybe the negativity about COVID-19 is not as bad. So we can still go about living our lives anyway. And once we think positive, we'll be fine. What do you think the psychological effect of this could be on all of us? I think that the, the goal of information is to help people understand when they get to understand, then they are able to uh, assign proportionate uh, measures and emotions to the varied you know, information that has been given. If you don't balance the information, they may be too afraid to do what they are supposed to do well. If you give the other side of the information too much to, they may be so relaxed that they may not even take the precautions they are supposed to take. So you need to always give the right information in a certain balanced way. And so that is why in this program, we both do the psychology bit of it and do the other aspects of it so that we have some balance in the information so that people's responses may be balanced. And I think that, for example, for me, I'm not afraid, but I'm very cautious mm. because of what I know. So that is what we need to do. It's like we need to give them the full information so that they are cautious and also and not afraid. And that is, that is the balance people need. Because if they get to understand, because we as doctors, we take all the precautionary measures because we know what it is. But mm -hmm. we are also not openly afraid about it because we know what it is. Yeah. And I think that that is so if someone is not taking precaution, it means the person doesn't understand the disease yet. And if someone too is overly afraid, it means the person also doesn't understand the disease yet. So that balanced information is what people need. Mm -hmm. If we give them all negatives all the time, they'll be too afraid to do the right things. If we give them the positives all the time, they'll be too relaxed to do the right things. But yeah. we need that kind of... We, we need that. Now, if I have yes. a, a strong mental health, they say that your mental health is what uh, determines your overall health as well. So let's just say that I'm identifying some of the, uh, the symptoms that may lead to coronavirus, and I may have it, but I'm like, okay, well, I'm so strong. I'm praying. I'm hoping that things are going to get better. And as a result, I avoid um, you know, going to the hospital, seeing the doctors and all that. Could that help? Uh uh, can you repeat it again? What Sorry. I mean by could that help is, so maybe I, it could boost my immune system and indirectly my mental health can fight the virus, so I would be fine. So then I don't necessarily have to go and see a doctor? Uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the mental health, you know, is, doesn't work in isolation, right? It works with other things. So, for example, if you have hypertension, blood pressure will go up if you don't take your medication. In addition to that, if you are overly afraid and panicking and overly stressed, that stress is going to influence the control of the blood pressure. So whilst you're taking the drugs and you are reducing your stresses and anxieties and all that, the combination is what makes the control of blood pressure effective. Mm -hmm. So you need combination, you know, therapy, mentally, emotionally, socially, physically, spiritually. You need that. Com that is what we call holistic care, where you use all the approaches to make sure that the person is it's the person's needs, health needs are addressed fully. So mental health issues do not work in isolation. In addition to mental health, 
with all the physical, social, and spirituality, the, the combination is what makes sure that people, you know, become totally well, mm. right? So you like, okay, I have positivity, I'm not afraid and all that, so the virus, <laughs> the virus won't do what it has to do. The virus may be doing what it has to do, but you need both, whatever, everything we are telling you together to be able to make sure that the person's holistic health care needs are, are met. So that is, that is what it is. Okay, Dr. Bertha, yesterday there was a report about some 10 food vendors and three taxi drivers who tested positive for COVID-19 at the Achimota General Hospital. And these are people who may have come into contact with God knows how many more people. How bad could this be? And looking at this situation, could we not have prevented it? Well, um, the only way I can understand that it's concerning because, you know, at the very, very beginning of the outbreak, there were reports of a Singaporean um, Uber driver who had tested positive and Uber therefore, you know, gave a few directives as to what to do. Yes. Um, the only way to prevent this or could have, we could have prevented this is we may have to consider these people as essential workers, even though they are not healthcare workers. Anybody who comes into frequent contact with the public, once we're saying we should go back to our normal way of living, all these people should have targeted um, testing, especially since we now have some type of antibody test. So immediately that's what comes to mind. I'm sure there are other innovative ways of including educating all these um, drivers, but and even the market women, but clearly very, very concerning. Mm, that, that means that there could possibly be a second lockdown if we keep recording cases like this, right? Um, I doubt if there will be. I haven't seen any country that has gone to a second lockdown. They would usually extend their lockdowns or maybe they'll say we're gradually easing back. But we, we lifted it in a way. Although I won't say we've completely lifted it because we're still practicing social some form distancing. of social. The fact that our yeah. schools and our churches are not meeting, we still have funerals limited to, I believe, less than 25 people. Those are all very, very important measures. You know, so I think that we're still, do we should not certainly go back to school. Um, we should keep large gatherings because the virus is still very, well and alive. In fact, yesterday I, I glanced at an article, I didn't quite read it. It was talking about the fact that besides the fact that when you have large crowds, there's more transmission, some people have actually measured the virus in the air, in the atmosphere where there's a crowd. And they've shown that just the air in a crowded area has a large amount of virus. And so maybe that's what even causes the transmission. It's not so much whose hand you shook Mm. or who you talk to when you were in a crowd. So if you have a large beach where there are lots of people, the environment becomes charged with the virus. So I think, back to your question, we should do some targeted testing of all these individuals. But what if after two weeks, because we're still waiting to hear from the president concerning um, you know, the ban on social gatherings, children going to school, and all of that, churches also converging as well. What if after two weeks, that ban, that ban is also lifted? Would it be advisable? Um, it will not be advisable, but if you go around the world from Sweden to United Kingdom, Sweden, I believe that today they are, they are reopening everything just back to normal. Um, you, United States is battling with this. Florida beaches are open. Um, it is a big, it's a big um, leadership dilemma at this time for almost every um, country because they're having to grapple with, and it's not just the reopening. It's the fact that it's hitting people's pocket, that mm. the effect on the social economic structure of a country. So, I mean, it, like China was able to do it so well because they moved everything to online. I don't know if we can do that. I mean, there was yesterday I was in a program where they showed us the streets of China when there was the lockdown. There was nobody on the street, zilts, no one. People were in their homes. Food was being delivered, medications. Everything was really, really high tech. In fact, the WHO said they don't know of any nation that will be able to duplicate what they did, you know? Yeah. But, and they were able to. Now they are completely out of their lockdown. But as they said, they said, look, we are not letting our guards down. We're not going to be fooled into thinking this virus is over at all. So back to our, our own context, I don't think it will be advisable but I'm sure the administration is under a lot of pressure. I mean, I'm just, I'm a churchgoer myself. I'm just imagining the pressure that this is putting on churches. 
if you have a large head building, you're still having to pay um, rent. Maybe the government will pick up your electricity, but you have to be paying your workers. Mm. I mean, all of this is a lot of stress on, I'm sure, a lot of churches. And, and, and parents have gone back to work. But children are at home. Who is going to watch the children? Do you take them to the market and expose them? So um, this, I believe, is, is a challenge of, 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 of leadership. I mean, this whole pandemic, from the WHO director to the, the smallest country president, it's been a challenge of how to lead, what to do, because people are having to make on-the-spot decisions and, and not simple decisions. So... I mean, I don't know what the administration is going to decide to do, but I mean, it, it, all, for all intents and purposes, if we're going to keep our numbers down, um, it may not be the appropriate time. Although what they've touted is that it looks like the, the, our disease severity index is not as high as in other countries. Mm. People seem to have mild cases for God knows um, what reason. Okay. Now, now, Dr. Newman, there was a funny video I came across last week. I think it was in India. They're still under lockdown, and it's very likely that they might even... I, I know they've extended it as well. Now, there were some people who decided to flout the lockdown rules. The police caught them, put them in an ambulance with another person who was faking to be uh, a coronavirus patient. I don't know if you saw it, but it was very hilarious. But I just thought about the kind of effect it was going to have on these people such that they would never want to leave their homes again. Coming to Ghana, we have lifted our lockdown, but there's also a directive to wear your face mask and also to educate more people. Can we start adopting some of these interesting um, you know, measures in order to let people really understand how serious this is? And what could be the effect it would have on all of us? I, 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 well, I think that that was, that was in, that, the, the right word is interesting. It, yeah. it, may, it may set a kind of fear and change their behavior in a way, but you realize that fear-provoking things may, um, may do some work over a short time. If they realize that it's all fake, they will go back to normal. But you need a certain measure that will, can be maintained for a while. You know, and that measure would have to be de determined by the government and enforced. Because whatever you do, there are people who don't understand what is going on. And there are people who will not comply, even if they understand. Actually, there are people who don't care. You know, there are some people who come to you for some therapy and they, they, they actually don't care about anything. It's like mm. whatever you do, do if I, I die, you know, and they're already struggling with something and they, they just don't care. And so if those who don't care will put everybody else, you know, life in danger, then we need a certain measure by the government, which is in the confines of the law, where there's an agreement that this is the measure and this is the appropriate, you know, force or the appropriate measure to use to control a certain human behavior. And that would help. But we can't allow people to do what they want to do, right? But that measure should, should be measured based on all the, you know, consultations from all, all kinds of angles to know that this is appropriate and, let, and let's implement it. Because whatever you do, there are people who just don't care about anything. But, and those mm -hmm. uh, just have to be gone. But it, is it not funny that once uh, we're all out going about our duties and people are being asked to wear their face masks, it looks as if the conversation about washing your hands regularly, using the sanitizer, that has gone down the drain and everybody seems to be focusing only on making sure I have my face mask. Yeah, it's, it's the information. You see, the brain, the brain is very, very powerful. You know, everything you hear, everything you see, the brain will process it. You know, it, it goes into all kinds of things, results in a certain emotional response, then an action is taken, right? So it, it starts from the information level. And I keep saying, we think everybody watches TV or everybody listens to the radio. They don't. And a lot of people... For so they go to town, they see a lot of people mask. They also want to wear because of what they, they, they see. And that is purely that. If the education doesn't go down too well, you know, you, you can't expect people to do what they have to do because what they see or hear or uh, whatever it's uh, happening around them, it's like it. For example, if they enter into a community and there's nothing even happening in the community, but everybody in the community is wearing a red dress, the likelihood that the person is going to pick a red dress and wear will be very high mm. because they see a group of people wearing a, and they feel odd and they may assign meaning to it and they are likely to follow. And that is human behavior. Human behavior is modeled after many things that people see or happen in a certain environment. So if everybody is washing their hands, everybody is in face masks, it is likely that 
someone would, 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 would fall in place. Let me give you a typical example. Let me use a school as an example. I work the Wesley Girls High School. Right? You go there mm. in the first month. Let's say if you're a first a first year student, the first month, you know, you came with all your baggages, right? Everything yeah. all over the place. But you know, within a week, everybody seems to fall in line because they go and meet a certain system that is so robust, so structured, so ordered. Everybody is doing everything in a certain particular way. <laughs> but, you know, you, you go and speak to them in the first week, everybody is all over the place. By the next week, you go and the same students who came from outside and they are doing everything they want to do now are falling like because of what they go, they go and meet. And that is what it is. You know, so behaviors can be modified in several ways, especially if we maintain a certain kind of structure and measure. In okay. Africa, we do things because we don't really have a certain way of doing things. So mm. anybody who comes into society does not follow. But if we have a certain structured measure around this season, everybody else is likely to follow. Okay. All right. Well, there are some questions from our viewers as well. So Anita will handle that. Okay. So this one says, uh, hi. Bella and Anita. Oh, good morning. My name is Emmanuel Edu Ntiamwa from Sound. Please, I'm asking that the face mask during the evening time, I don't see people putting on the mask. My question is that uh, does the virus not spread in the evening? Because most people don't put the nose mask on in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> no. And this is in relation to, you know, countries that have uh, come up with curfews as well. Because sometimes they ask that doesn't mean that the virus only. Um, you know, it's transmitted at a certain time and not a certain time. That's a better. No, I mean, clearly it's transmitted all, <laughs> the whole day. <laughs> and the, the question reminds me of the mosquito nets, you know. Those who have, I mean, when we were, and I went to Wesley Girls, by the way, so when Dr. Newman was talking, I was laughing. I mean, we, we had to use mosquito nets when we went to bed. And it was good. It protected us at night. But the question that people have asked is that, okay, so you use a mosquito net at night. So what about during the day when there's no mosquito net? What will you do? Mm. I told them, well, you are more awake. So you are more likely to um, drive the mosquitoes away yourself just by virtue of your movement. So yes, um, the person has asked a good question. The mask should be used probably until you are going to bed and you know you are not going to interact with other people. It's not a daytime mask at all. Okay, <laughs> Okay. so I guess he, he has been answered. This one says, hi, Anita and Bella. Please ask Dr. Bertha how the first person got the virus and what is the difference between the coronavirus which occurred in 2003 and the coronavirus now? Yeah, so they are actually very, very similar. They have what they call 96% homology, meaning when they look at the genetic material of the virus, it has only 4% genetic material that is different and it, it presents pretty much the same way um, except that one had a high mortality about 30 percent meaning 30 out of 100 people died whereas this one has a mortality of one percent secondly they both started in china um, from from a district in china so there are a lot of similarities which makes people think did someone tweak the same virus a little bit um, and that's why we have this, but I don't want to go there at this time. And it also explains why this one is called SARS-CoV-2, because it was so similar that instead of just calling the other one SARS, that one became renamed as SARS-CoV-1, and this one is SARS-CoV-2. They both affect the respiratory system, and they are both coronaviruses. So they are very, very similar. How did it start? I don't know. Um, we just know that it has almost a good a good portion of this genetic material seems to be similar to the the coronavirus found in bats. And people have questioned, is it the type of food that the Chinese were eating? Mm -hmm. I don't know, because even in Ghana and Kenya, they've done our scientists have been doing studies on coronavirus bats forever. And we know that our bats carry some type of coronavirus. They're just not able to um, cross over and infect humans. And I keep giving the keyhole analogy that animal viruses cannot infect human viruses because they don't have the apparatus to open the, the, the door to our cells. So it, somehow, when they're able to make a photocopy of a key that can open the doors to our cells, then they come in. So some type of mutation 
must allow an animal coronavirus to obtain the key that opens the doors to human cells. And so that is why this disease is being called a zoonosis. We don't know whether it started in a lab, but there was a book that was written by somebody in 1980. That's about 40 years ago. My son keeps asking, mom, why aren't we interviewing the author of this book? Because in the book, the person talks about a, a virus from Wuhan city. He talks about a lab. They mentioned Russia, US and um, China working on a lab and how somebody was working in the lab, something happened, they got infected, and they left the lab and infected a bunch of children. And finally, one woman who was looking for her son found her son. But the difference is that the virus in that book was attacking the brain, and the brain melts within four hours, except this little boy was not dying. I mean, there's so many similarities between that book written 40 years ago, the city, the location, the lab, the countries involved, even professors who were fired from their jobs because they were selling information between countries that people have wondered, is it the same thing? Did the, did the author know something about this thing that's going to happen 40 years later? But you know what? At this point, we want to focus on getting better. Yesterday, I was giving an analogy to someone that if you have bees, a swarm of bees in your house and they are biting everybody, your immediate goal is to protect people. You're not going to start asking Kofi and Ama who opened the door, who went to the beehive. I mean, at this point, we don't have the time to be wondering who let the bees out. We just know they're in our houses and we have to get them out. So that is an answer to the question. Okay, another okay, one. So this one says, good morning, Anita and Bella. Please ask your experts if the asymptomatic carriers can recover unknowingly because of the nature of the virus. <laughs> Whether they can recover unknowingly. Yes. Yes. I mean, clearly, that is why they recover. We, they, don't, they don't even know they have symptoms. They don't even know they're ill. And so they're going to recover without knowing. And usually the antibody test in combination, which is the IgG, IgM, the thought is that once you have an infection, the IgG will last for several months, if not forever. And so that's the only way we're going to be able to know. But there'll be a lot of, I mean, think of stars like Idris Elba, Kevin Durant, and a few other people. If they had never gotten the test, they would never know they're infected. And I think the last time I was sharing the story of a family where the six-year-old was PCR positive, antibody positive. And if it wasn't because it was under a research condition or maybe the physician decided to test all of them, that little boy would never know that he had it. We wouldn't know the two-year-old in the house has even had it and recovered and never showed a sign. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Okay, so this one says, good morning, Bella and Anita. I've been having sore throat for about two months now. I went to the clinic several times and I've taken a lot of medications and I'm crying to you through uh, to get me through to any doctor to find out whether it can be COVID-19 and how long a symptomatic person can live. Hmm. Throat for two months is concerning. Um, the person needs to at least, if not, the person, I think at this point, the person needs an ear, nose, and throat physician to look down their throat because most causes of sore throats, group A strep, um, mild coronaviruses, infection, or whatever, they usually last about a week. So if you have symptoms for two months, um, you have to think of where the what what causes sore throat. It's inflammation of the larynx and the nasal pharynx. Mostly the larynx, your voice box. So, and it can be several things. It could even be tuberculosis. Tuberculosis causes the form of laryngitis. So if you've had a sore throat for that long, somebody needs to be looking down. It could even be cancer, for example. You would think it's a sore throat, but there's something growing on that um, part of the respiratory lining. It could be cancer, tuberculosis, it could be anything. Sometimes it could even be a thyroid tumor pressing on the on the larynx. So it shouldn't be taken lightly. The person should ask that they be referred to a higher level where a specialist will look down their throat to make sure if it's just a simple sore throat or it's something else. Okay. Well, on that note, doctors, thank you so much for speaking to us. And Dr. Newman, uh, definitely tomorrow. I don't know if you're going to give us some more, you know. <laughs> We're looking for it. It's more hope, right?
And Dr. Nima yeah. is a clinical psychologist. And also Dr. Betha Sewa Ai. Thank you always yes. as well for coming through for us. And she is an infectious My disease pleasure. specialist. Have a good day. We do um, for teleconsultation. You know, <laughs> definitely. But have a good day. Thank you so much. And well, yes, it's still COVID-19, 360. We have some more messages that we'll be reading out. And so if you have any message to send, you can find us at TV3 Ghana across our social media pages, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. And now we're shifting our focus to some Ghanaians who may have been stranded in South Africa due to the lockdown. Now, the majority of these people may have gone there for business or for pleasure. But unfortunately, they had their business cut short as a result of COVID-19. This time around, instead of being able to return home, Ghana was under lockdown and South Africa also initiated its lockdown. And so they've been left stranded. And if they don't have money to pay further for a hotel and uh, don't have family in South Africa as well, then what are they going to do? And how easy or difficult is it going to be trying to get back home on time? And so I'll be speaking to one of such people. He is Kinsley and he currently is in South Africa. Now he says that he went there for business and unfortunately got stuck. Good morning, Kinsley, and thank you for joining us. I hope you're well. Good morning. Uh, yes, I'm doing well, please. Okay, so tell us a story from the beginning. When did you leave for South Africa? Okay, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to air my frustrations on your media. I, I left Ghana on the, on the 8th of March. Okay. And I was supposed to return back on the 5th of April. On the 5th of April? I was supposed to return on the 5th of April. Mm. Yes. So uh, I got here by on the 9th of uh, March. I started going out to do my business here and there. Then before then, before I started hearing that the, the infection, people are, being, uh, people are getting the infection and here and there. By the time I realized, they said they are around 50. The next day, the two time, they said they are 200 and all those things. By the time I realized, hey, um, there were some restrictions already that you cannot even make a move to go out again. Were there restrictions and, in um, South Africa by yes, then? Okay. When, yeah, exactly. When this thing started, when they started it, they started giving some directives and all those things. So. I was like, well, I don't know whether I'm going or I'm staying or whatever. And moreover, it is something that I've never experienced before in my life. Mm. So I don't know how things are going to happen like. So I, in fact, I called my airline to find out that I'm supposed to return on the 5th of April. So am I going to get a flight? Because, in fact, I have no clue to what is happening. So mm -hmm. he said they were going to get back to me. Or no. And I didn't get any feedback from them. So, on the 26th of, uh, of March, March, yeah, yes, and then there was a lockdown. Hoping that maybe before my time, maybe there will be flights to go back home. And then when we get to the time, there was no flight. And in fact, things are beginning to be very difficult because I, while I leave, I, I have to rent a place. It's not a family home, so I paid hmm. for that place. It's about $250 a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, yeah, so, you know, you have to go up. You have to do everything by yourself and here and there. It was getting more frustrating because I don't even know when I'm leaving. I don't even know when I'm getting out from here. And then, in fact, I'm not working here for me to say that um, at least I'm going to earn some income here. So... Whatever I, is, I can still manage to some whatever time this thing will be over. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Before you even move on, let me ask. So, did you at least alert the Ghana mission in South Africa um, when you got into South Africa? Because as at that time, there had been conversations about infections in Africa as well. And so, did you even expect that anything like this was going to happen? And did you get in touch with the Ghana mission there? Well, I... I you know, you and I, you know that this our generation we have not experienced something like this before. So it was kind of difficult to anticipate what is going to happen. So in fact, what I did was to 
I call, I try calling the embassy, the high commission. Anytime you call them, there's an, it's an entry machine. And so a good Samaritan gave me one officer over there to talk to. So when I spoke with, her, with him, he also directed me to someone who was in charge of these situations like this. Mm. In fact, I spoke with her. And the, what she was saying is that, um, what she was Okay. The thing is that yeah. there's nothing at the moment that they can do to uh, help us because there's no gun to pass. Yeah, so if there's any need, anything, they will let us know. So say what? There was okay. nothing they could do for you because there was no funding? Is that what you said? Yeah, there's no any directive from above. That's we, we, they, they, there's no directive from above. So if there's anything, they will let me. Okay, but I or know that... They also... Mm -hmm. Carry on, they sorry. also confirmed to me that a lot of people have been calling. Mm. They also made me know that a lot of people have been calling mm -hmm. for a new boyfriend. Okay, now you being a businessman, I know we're supposed to have gotten a, a few other people to join us in this conversation so as they well. Also are short. Roughly, how many more people do you have there from Ghana who have been stranded? Well, I, I could confidently say that we are... More than 100, please. More than 100 Ghanaians. How are they all surviving? Yes. You are saying that you've paid $250 a month for accommodation. And this is cost yes. that you hadn't budgeted for, right? Very well. What about these yes. other people? Do you have any idea how they are also managing? Well, I, you know, everybody for himself, God for us all. So sometimes I don't know how they are surviving. But what I know is that they are stranded. They are ready to go back home and... That's all they are all craving. So when I contacted them, it's like, I mean, when I contacted them, we should, let's find a way to let the government hear of us. They were so excited. Mm. And unfortunately, they are supposed to be with us. But just the fact that there's a lockdown, you can't go anywhere, you cannot locate people, you cannot travel anywhere. So right. that is, if not, we would have been getting a lot of people at the background talking to you. Okay, are you ready to pay for your flight back? That means that you may have lost out on the ticket that could have brought you back home already because you paid for that previously. Now, I remember that South Africa uh, chartered a flight to come for some of its citizens from Ghana, and they had to pay for right. the ticket. If government says that we're going to do the same for you, are you willing to pay for a ticket to come back home? The, the hard truth is that it's going to be difficult for me to say I'm going to pay for another ticket when I know very well that as I'm traveling, I'm supposed to pay in and out. And I did so. And as I'm sitting here, as I'm standing here right now, most of my money has gone into rent, feeding, and other stuff. So I, 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 it's going to be difficult for me to pay for another ticket now. Mm. What I, I was pleading for the government to do is either he evacuate us from here or he open up the airport for us to come back so that the airlines can come and then pick us from But there. But these airlines have run down. South Africa Airways has sent every worker home, basically. And so it is not operating at this point. I don't know if they are the ones you flew with. It could have been another flight. But I'm just talking about how the, you know, the, the, the flights have also been affected badly by COVID-19. And so there's probably no, no way they can even refund the money. At this point, what if they also say that we don't have money to even fly you back because we've run out of well, business? Well, that's going to be difficult because, in fact, I spoke with the airlines, the one I brought here, at yeah. South Africa Airway, is Rwan Air. Okay. I have been in contact with the agents in Ghana, and they are ready to even, even if it is not Rwan Air that is coming. Mm-hmm. Kinsley, can you hear us? Sorry, come again. So you were talking about the conversation you had with the authorities at Rwanda, and what did they say? Very well. I had... Okay. Well, we're having a challenge. Netflix, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Please go on. Sorry. Uh, so I had a conversation with the agent in Ghana, that's Rwan Air. And they were like, if anything, they are ready to fix that into any other airlines that is coming to Ghana. So what matters most is that the airport is not working. So they cannot come there. 
So okay. that is a frustrating thing now. Yeah. But you know that for every traveler that came into Ghana on the 21st and 22nd of March, they were put into yeah. mandatory quarantine. Um, so you are going to have to deal with that if government even decides to open the ports. Um, uh, that's not a problem. At it's least not. I'm at, at okay. Home. But, but we at spoke least to... I'm at home, so mm. I, I don't have a problem yet. All right. We, we spoke to someone in South Africa, and he mentioned that the authorities were giving out, you know, some food and some money to citizens, as well as some other Ghanaian nationals who are living there as well. Have you received any, have you heard of any Ghanaian living in South Africa that's benefiting from this and possibly if you could also benefit? No, if there's anything like that, I'm sure the High Commission would have let me know about it because I even spoke with them in a few uh, minutes ago. Uh, I spoke with them. So if there's anything, there's one thing that they were trying to let me know that in, they have associations all Ghanaians here have association. Each province have association. So uh, most of the time, they have registered with them as a commission, as a mission. So in case of anything that happens to them, they come to their rescue. So okay. I said that me, I don't live here. I don't stay here. I'm here to do business and go back. So whatever happens, I have to fall on my mission, high commission here. So that was what I'm doing. Hmm. So they said that our case is a exceptional one. They said our case is a exceptional one. So if there's anything, they, they will let us know. Kisley, do you have so family in South to... Africa? Sorry? Do you have family in South Africa? Just in case this lockdown extends. And just in case Ghana also extends, um, you know, the, the closure of its borders. Do you have any family uh, that you can rely on? Well, I have a sister that uh, is not here with me. She okay. lives around sometimes. In case of anything, I fall on her. But the truth is, uh, I, I live somewhere, and she's also living somewhere. And because of the lockdown, we don't even meet each other. If there's anything, then there's another electronic electronic means that she can assist with me, mm. assist me with. So that has been the the frustrating thing. And so I am not sure that anybody is sharing food to any stranded Ghanaians in South Africa. This if whoever tough. said that, well, I, I have not gotten the opportunity to get that offer from anyone. Okay. All right. Well, Kinsley, thank you so much. And we hope and pray that our authorities uh, have watched this interview and, you know, hopefully there's something that can be done am about I, it. Am, am I talking to Bella? Yes, this is Bella. Bella, Bella Mundi, you know, I want, please, if you can give me a minute of your time to just say something. Okay. All right. I, they're saying that uh, out of sight is out of mind. Uh, I want to plead to our president, Nana Akufuado, this afternoon or this morning, that, uh, yes, we are out of sight, but we are not out of mind. We are citizens, and we are one of his children who are stranded somewhere in the world, and we are pleading with him that... I know he is a father of us. He loves all of us. He wants to protect all of us. I am begging him that we are stranded. He should do something for his stranded citizens who are living in other countries. And we will never forget if he does so. Um, I'm also pleading that every other, the ministry should also do something for us. And even if they have to contact the embassy or the high commission here, they should do that because in fact, they are not in to assist anybody. Hmm. And I'm pleading with the president to come to our aid. All right, Kinsley. Thank you very much. I mean, my, my heart is breaking here, but I really hope that something can be done about it. Please stay safe. Hold on. Help is coming. Bella, thank you. So much. Thank you so much Sorry, for speaking to us. Thank you, Bella. God bless you. God bless you too. Anita, Ciao. Really this, is sad. Sad. this is a sad ending to COVID-19 today. Really, really, really sad. Yeah. Honestly, if there's something we can do, I think we need to do and help him and other people. I'm, I'm getting emotional. I think we need to wrap up. Yeah. I think so too. And so, Mr. President, this is a message we're leaving at your doorstep and hopefully something can be done about it. Save our Ghanaian um, citizens who are stranded in other countries. This has been COVID-19 360. We'll be back tomorrow. Have a good day.